and hey guys and welcome to episode 55 of the garage athlete shows we've had a short hiatus um a lot lots been going on i believe the last time me and dan were on it was just before we launched the last group um but yeah there's been stuff going on in personal lives um I've been getting really far into prep and just trying to kind of like balance everything. So we are back. It's something that I um, we've all made a commitment to uh, get back on in terms of getting these recorded, getting some question boxes out there into uh, the group so we can start interacting as coaches again. So I'm joined tonight by the lovely Rachel Smith. So for those of you that don't know, Rachel is one of the co-hosts on the Garage Athlete Show. But again, life tended to take over. We'll, we'll probably delve into that a little bit more uh, in a second for some new New exciting opportunities for Rachel, which means that she might have a little bit more more time for us now. Um, so yeah, how how are you, Rach? So for those that don't know, Rachel's had a big move. She's moved from near Newcastle to near Newcastle upon Lyne. Lyne or so, Lyne? Yeah. It's Newcastle under Lyne. That's it. There we go. Yeah. Uh, just keep it easy. Newcastle, Newcastle, simple. Um, yeah. So I'm Rachel. I've been on the um this a couple of times but kind of when we're getting into the thick of things I then um caught COVID <laughs> partly through the last transformation which was a little a little bit annoying taking a massive toll on everything and then recently moved my life my business everything down here in the next week or so I'm starting my part-time NHS roles a pelvic health therapist um and obviously I've moved my business so most of my business at the minute is online and that is just um I kind of specialise in pelvic health coaching with strength athletes, like work with international level strong women as well, but also like day to day athletes as in like what we're working within the transformation group. So as a kind of overall, I'm an online coach, but I have, as you guys have your own specialisms within that and mine are pelvic health and strength training as well. Um, so yeah, yeah, co COVID. I had the, I, I went to um, Stockport and I did a, uh, in-person session for coaches and um, a real mix that was really good to kind of educate on the things that they're unaware that their clients are going through because it's something that's not spoken about and um, but it's kind of how to help them help others because I'm one person and as much as I'd love to coach millions of people it's not going to happen so the idea is there use my teaching background and um, to go into the field of coaching coaches so me just like delivering a two and a half hour session practical session then has an impact on 15 to 20 coaches who then have an impact on however many so you know that's like that that's more than I could have asked for and it, it was such a good start and that's something that's going to be coming up more and um, now I've moved as well kind of traveling around different gyms and going into um, their space to help their coaches help others as well um that's awesome yeah so then Delivered the workshop, had the interview on Wednesday, got offered the job, caught COVID on Saturday. <laughs> and then it was like, right, well, I'm meant to be moving. I couldn't find anywhere to move. Everything was still online because of COVID. Um, but touch wood, we're in a good place now. I've just yes. still got the gym to sort out and the walls behind me are no longer green in the house. So That's, that, is, that is always a positive. That, yes. that shade of green was an interesting choice as well. Like, what? Let's go plural there. The, the yeah. ceiling is still green. There's three colours. It was like, oh, wow. okay. colour, three different green. Real. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, <laughs> how can anyone like green that much? <laughs> you know. Clearly, clearly green was kind of their, their favourite colour. So... What, yeah, what's been up with you then, Don? Like, catch us up on where you're at in prep, because, yeah, since the last recorded, it's like, huge life things have come in the way. So I'd be really interested in kind of how you've prioritised and navigated through them, because it applies to all of us. Like, how do yeah. we continue with our goals, despite life literally kicking us in the balls? Mm. Well, so I've, I've coached a couple of guys through prep before. Um, both of them actually dropped out because what they didn't realize is how much prep takes over your life. It's not like a normal diet. So like we very much preach balance. Don't let your diet like take over your life. That's not what it's about. With a bodybuilding prep, it's slightly different because I'd say probably the first half of it, you can do like that. Then so the first 
eight kilos that I dropped. I, I practiced what I preached. It was very balanced. I was still here doing the podcast each week. I could show up, I could give my clients 100% of my attention, everything like that, because it wasn't taking up a major chunk of my life. However, this last like four kilos has just been so much harder and it's it's been progressively increasing. So I've gone from doing like um, two bouts of half an hour of a cardio a week to do about 40 minutes of cardio like pretty much every day. So it's probably five sessions a week now. So all my rest days and three of my training days, I've got training at one part, one part of the day. And then I've got cardio at the other half of the day, if I can split it up. Sometimes I'm doing an hour, hour and 15 minutes in the gym. And then I'm just jump straight on the bike and do 40 minutes on the bike and then get off the bike and do 15 minutes of posing practice. So it, it's one of those things that first it starts out as not, being that disruptive but it very very quickly ramps up over time to now where I was having to pick what was the priority yeah I think like at at that point that you've just said there like in our the transformation group that's a really big thing that we're trying to educate on like don't go balls deep from the start because you've got nowhere to go and really like you are now in the depths of prep yeah if you are doing a transformation which is like a lifestyle one where you just want to look feel move um better and be a better partner be there for your kids a lot more more present and mindful that's enough you don't need to do what you're now having to do because it's a completely different phase of everything isn't it and, and that's just it like i've been this deep into it now for six weeks ish and you, you it's not sustainable it's just it's just not sustainable like i'm starting to feel the the mental fatigue now just things simple things like we went out um to downtown yesterday um i'd eaten all my meals i'd eaten meal one eaten meal two uh when i should have had meal three we were out so i was just like you know what we'll go we'll go grab some food you guys go grab some food i what i tend to do when i'm eating out is just go for the high protein option just low carb and then when i get home i'll top up my carbs like rice cakes or something just because that's much easier i'm very good at like looking at a portion of food and going "Mm, that's about right or it's not because that's come through education and time isn't it you can't eyeball from the start like everything serves a purpose well it's two years of weighing every single thing that i eat now when i look at it i can go that's about 120 grams of chicken or 150 grams of beef or whatever but yeah you're completely right that comes from experience and it comes from having done that for so long but yeah we we kind of got there and I was looking at the options and I was going I literally can't eat any of this like even the high protein options like the high protein options were a steak pie or cottage pie so I was like okay I can eat this I'll then have a massive pang of guilt I'll then either go and binge eat later on or I will then starve myself. And that's not that's not what I want to do. So if I just I've got to skip this meal and try and make it up later yeah. in the day. But you know you know yourself though, and that's it. It's like that for you would then be a trigger in one or two very different ways. So it's yeah. then it's that kind of abstinence from things, which serves a purpose right now, but when you're not this deep into prep. Yeah. Of course, you're going to go out, you're going to enjoy meals and you adjust your macros accordingly across exactly. that week. But right now, that's not something that's going to allow you to make that day to day progress that you're looking for and that you're working towards, is it? it? It's one of those things now to get this last kilo, kilo and a half off. Like I'm having to do things that are that are not healthy. They're not a healthy balance, like bodybuilding at this at, to get to this level of conditions it's not healthy it messes with your mind and it messes with your body as well so what i then found was then obviously natalie got something to eat so did ben so did josh and so did willow so they were all eating their food and i had a diet coke and i was just trying to sip on that and not look at it and i could smell it and like in my head i was having to every few seconds basically make a decision to not eat that don't pick at their food don't do this don't do that then i found by the time i got home i was so decision fatigued that it was just like I think if somebody had put something in front of me I'd have just eaten it because I'd had to say no 20 or 30 times in that meal and that's a part of um like dieting and kind of lifestyle change that people 
underestimate is decision fatigue. It's what you want to do is one, don't make decisions when you're hungry. You always make poor decisions when you're hungry. <laughs> and two, take out the majority of those decisions. Plan your food ahead of time. It's one of the reasons why in my one-to-one program, I go, right, we're going to structure your breakfast and lunch and your snacks. Yeah. And then you can then make a decision about tea time because then you don't have to think about it. Well, here's the tea time option as well. So just in case you're struggling with that, you can fall back on this. And it's not that like diet plans like work or they don't work. It's just, it's giving you something to fall back on for when you are then fatigued from having to kind of make all those decisions and it's it's something that I'd forgotten how hard it is like being here in this place and yeah this is the bit that people underestimate it's not as I said the first half of this dieting phase was relatively easy for me now I've I've dieted like dozens of times now and flexible dieting and all that kind of stuff is this second nature to me it's it's this this latter half where it's like eking out those those final things to get striated lower back and get your glutes to kind of come in and stuff like that like that's the bit that I think people when you kind of look at physiques and think oh I think it'd be nice to have a six-pack trust me getting sub like eight percent body fat is not fun the thing is though you you get yourself to a level where people would look and be like right he's ready to set up on stage but that's for you when the real work begins, isn't it? That's just where the striations come in. That's where the real mental fatigue and literally you become more robotic because you're doing what you have to do to serve a purpose. And that is your ultimate goal. And it's reminding yourself of it as well. And yeah. it's that's an unhealthy side of it. And again, it's the side where people look at bodybuilding and go, yeah, it, you've got, where's, your, where's your family life? Where's your enjoyment in life? And it's like, well, my enjoyment comes from the process and the sport. And ultimately what my goal is to get up on stage. And if someone doesn't understand it, cool, that's their bad. Like they don't get it, but it's yeah. not for them to impart their judgment on you because, you know, they might be, they might be doing something else in life that you don't necessarily agree with or understand, but you know, that's what they want to do. So you respect their decision ultimately. Um, and yeah. I know like when I've like died at like, when I got ridiculously lean um you've always got people who are so keen to kind of throw you off track because it makes them feel a bit better about not following through on the decisions that they've made and then gone yeah that's a bit hard that like I don't really want that salad I'd, I'd rather have that burger and people will always do that because it makes them feel better about themselves and without realizing it it kind of it it puts up barriers towards how people view each other and how much respect you show each other as well. So it's always really useful to have people around you who kind of get what you're doing and respect it and don't bring it up in conversation or will kind of deter the subject away from like, why are you doing that? What are you doing this and that for? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And well, I've got a... So my mum passed away recently. So we're planning the funeral and everything. And it's like the funeral slash the wake is going to be about seven days, no, eight days before I compete. Yeah. Which means I'm going to, it's going to be the first time that my extended family has ever seen me in like contest ready condition. That's if I'm in condition, actually. Like there's still some debate whether I'm going to do this show on September 18th. Depends on if, if I'm in condition or not. Like when I look at my photos and I put my stuff up on Instagram, as you said, people are like, oh, mate, you look great. Like when are you competing, blah, blah, blah. And then my coach is like, yeah, you've still got like two and a half kilos to go. And I'm yeah. just like, oh my God, where? <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it. But again, this is why having that professional eye. Mm. So I have a coach because he's a bodybuilding coach he knows what to look for kind of like at that level so even though I look shredded to the average person it's no your glutes are still fat (laughs) get back on that bike (laughs) with your cushion because your bum is absolutely killing oh don't don't get me started (laughs) and it turns out as well what I was I was sitting on the bike wrong so obviously spin bikes aren't designed for you to sit up on you're meant to sit forward and hold on to the things so that's what was giving me my bruised coccyx as I was sitting up on it and my (laughs) coccyx basically sat on a really hard bit of the seat so it's a little it's a little bit better now that I'm actually sitting on sitting on the uh, the spin bike correctly so how are things going with you like um I know so we've covered home business training like are you 
in any sort of routine at the moment? Like what, so, what do you do? Because I know it's gone a little bit out the window. So I think a lot of people will probably be, probably be interested to hear about that from a coach's point of view, how things obviously aren't ideal right now, but how are you, mm. how are you coping with that? How are you working around it? So I was ill earlier on in the year, like, like seriously ill, a lot of like um, bloating and things like that. And that was just, that was down to stress. And I've never, the, the past year and a half, like you guys know kind of just what things have been like a little bit longer. And um, I've managed it and it just really took a toll on me. Um, so I had to pull back and just kind of take my life down to the least stressful level it could ever be, including from like an anti-inflammation perspective, no caffeine, very regimented on what I was eating um, to kind of just help my body cope with the stress that was being put on it. So I'm in a more physiological um, ready state to deal with anything. And that included sort of readdressing sleep hygiene and everything like that. Training picked back up. My phone might die there actually. Training picked back up. Um, then it was sort of getting ready for the move and then COVID had hit us. But what had happened with the stress and everything earlier was like a previous shoulder injury from last year in my lower back just all crept up this is what happens when your body's in a stressed state so um, I was working with a coach to help address things and that was going really well and COVID hit um, so going from kind of an in injury management perspective which was just kind of getting me back into training it was um, squat modifications deadlift modifications um, and a lot of machine-based work so a bit more like bodybuilding type COVID hit, obviously ill. I remember maybe four weeks after having contracted it and still not feeling great, I was like, right, I feel like I should go and do a session. And I was doing um, lateral step ups, no weight or anything, six to eight reps per side just to get moving because I wanted to start to load my joints in different ranges. And I was blowing out of my horse, as in I just felt like I'd run up 50 flights of stairs and I couldn't get my breath in my lungs. Like, COVID it hit me really, really hard. Um, yeah, that's one of the things I've heard about it. Is even in um, relatively healthy individuals, like the the after effects is the lungs. It just yeah. it just really, really attacks your lungs. So anybody who's got asthma or any sort of issue with their lungs already are really, really struggling with like the longer term effects of it. Yeah, hugely. Um, I mean, it. it it wasn't ideal then that I had to move my house and my business, especially moving the gym up onto a first floor building either. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's kind of taxed me. So really, I haven't like I haven't been training. It was more I, I then just go to um, like a local gym and I do a little bit of cardio conditioning because what I wanted to do is get my body prepared for movement and being able to recover from an oxygen perspective, and um, sure. to make sure that I wasn't just literally blown out my arse and feeling like I couldn't catch my breath. I felt like everything was like stopping here. Mm -hmm. um, then pretty much just did functional training by carrying all my kit into the house and into vans like shrugged farmers carries up emergency stairs you know like all the good stuff and then um yeah so I'm looking forward to from next week once I'm getting all the gym boxed up floor and down everything this weekend getting back into routine but because I'm kind of for me quite detrained at the minute I'm sort of looking at more of like a recomp phase um in terms of my nutrition and my training so Again, I wouldn't be starting going back in, doing a little bit more machine-based work. Um, really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be addressing my pelvic floor quite a lot myself, just in terms of my breathing mechanics, just because of what I know from the COVID perspective, like the impact that's had on me. I've got a few clients that we're having to address things with as well. Um, and then looking forward, we're actually getting back to some sort of hybrid powerlifting, strongman, bodybuilding, like just just falling back in love with training really but at the minute I just I look at myself and I'm like I'm a I'm just not I don't recognize my shape anymore and that yeah. for me it's from a mindset perspective is a big one but then it's kind of as we talk about it's boxing things off and going okay what I've done at the moment hasn't necessarily been what I wanted to do but it's what I needed to do um, and yeah. in terms of like where does my energy and focus need to go is me training going to allow me to then do the things I need to do for my home and business right now it's not so it kind of doesn't go on the back burner but it becomes less of a priority 
And then yeah. from a recovery perspective, I, I can't do that because I'm just going to run myself into the ground for starting a new job in a new area and then continue to grow my business as well. So yeah. it's all different priorities at different times. And I feel so I've approached this mentally in a very good way, whereas the old me would have just gone like balls to the wall, do this, do that, and I'd be asleep now, mate. <laughs> I think it's interesting what you've said there, because as you said, like what most people do in that situation is they go, oh, I don't have time. And it's one of those things where yes, you do have time. However, what you've said there is it's not a priority for me right now, mm -hmm. which is OK. Like people get really butthurt when I say like I'll be, I'll, I DM people a lot on Instagram and Facebook just because they've interacted with me and I, I quite like uh, interacting with people and having conversations because it's one of the reasons why we've set this podcast up. I love talking about health and fitness. And one of the most common things people say is I, I just, I don't have time. And it's like, okay. And then when you say, okay, we'll try saying, well, it's not a priority for me right now. They get really, really defensive about it. Yeah. And it's like, you've just told me you don't have time you've got the same 24 hours in a day as everybody else does everybody's busy however if I literally sat you on a laptop is one thing that I do if my if my clients come to me and say they don't have time it's okay right let's book in half an hour and we'll go through I call it the perfect week planner and basically I pull up a spreadsheet and most people were nine to five so like we'll have time slots from like six in the morning till 11 p.m. at night, because most people are asleep by 11 and up by six. So those are taken out by sleep. And then we'll go, okay, so what time do you work nine to five? We'll block that in and we'll go, okay, well, what other responsibilities do you have? And you'll put that in like school runs, um, like cooking food, um, all the other responsibilities people do. And you, you block those in and very rarely do those things that they have to do cover more than say 20 hours on top of working 40 hours a week and sleeping about 40 hours a week and it's normally leaves about 25 hours left it's like well what are you doing in that time they, they can't honestly tell you and what yeah. they nine times out of ten what they're doing is they're watching netflix they're surfing on their phone they're, they're doing other things whereas for yourself you've said it's not a priority for me right now because of my health because you wouldn't be able to recover from it so you're doing what you can from a recoverability point of view you just you're not making excuses of i don't have time you've actually made the conscious decision of well no i know what my body's going to be able to deal with it's not a priority for me right now to be as strong as i can my priority for me right now is getting my business back off the ground just being able to move and feel good and actually, I don't want to be chasing goals of like doing three rep maxes or adding on a shed load of muscle mass. And I, I just I think it's interesting that you're in a position now where you're comfortable enough in yourself to say that. Yeah, I think it's a, that's a big one. It's that reframing, rephrase. And I'll always coach clients through on this. Like um, if you've got someone who's managing an injury, it's getting their head into the space of, what are you doing that is supporting the goal and where we're heading to? And how can we make that a positive experience? Because I could be saying, right, well, I'm like, I'm loose, I've lost muscle. Okay, how long is that going to take to get back? Right, well, now I'm in a bad mindset for actually moving forward because I'm going to have to go get my logbook back out. I'm going to be starting where I was, however long ago, I've made no progress. And all I'm doing is putting my mind into a negative space which isn't going to serve me the purpose of achieving well across the board, managing my health, managing my sleep, managing my business and everything. So it's, it, you know, you, you know yourself that it comes from kind of experience, but also like that critical reflection where you're really honest with yourself. And for all I'd love to say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be in the gym every day, I'm going to be training, or I'm going to start next week, four or five sessions. Like it's the same as what we do on the transformation challenge. Like if you know, that when you've sat down and you've gone through your week, you only can commit, but you can definitely commit to two sessions. Go and fucking do those two sessions. And then anything more than that is even better. We always, I always go with kind of what's the goal? What is better? What's best? What is good? 
and good is what you want to be consistently and everything beyond that is just going to accelerate where you're working towards even faster but we're not looking behind and it's a case of we always want to find what that good is and stay consistent with it because then we build on and that good becomes kind of your baseline and that's where having experienced coaches comes in because we between the three of us I've, I've been a PT for nine years I think Dan is on seven, seven or eight I think you're on a similar amount as well so there's what nearly 25 years worth of combined experience in there like we're quite good at establishing what is one is a manageable level and actually when you're burning out because we can say to you right pull back yeah. <laughs> you're doing too much like I just on that point there, um, like one of the things I've recently gone through with one of my powerlifting clients, um, she had switched coaches. She's got a younger coach, less experienced, but he's a good guy. And um, my other coach has actually moved on yeah, career wise, I think. Um, so she's received a new program. She actually does one session with him a week as well. And he is literally putting her in the bin at the end of sessions. And I was like, right, I need to just get you to reiterate to me where we what we've gone through um because we're working together on like pelvic health side which are then feeding for training and I was like give me a program because we'll always consult and make sure things are managed and matched and fed in so it's not additional work um and I was like I don't know how I would recover and you've got 12 years on me I am not peri or postmenopausal you're actually on HRT as well and he knows these things you've gone through it in your park cube he is not approaching this from a health perspective as in we're in the health profession we always have to come back to the reasons why the person's come to us and at the bottom of everything is health irrespective of goals and everything that is what our responsibility and duty of care is so I was like you need to be honest with them because it doesn't matter how much fuel you put in you for this session or how much you leave between that session and your next that is far too much for you to recover from in one session so again that's having a difficult conversation and I was like I'll happily speak to him because the things that we're working on together are not going to work well because you're being pushed beyond what your recovery capacity is yeah. and unfortunately as females we go through those three phases in life and that's like puberty then you go to like your childbirth and years and then you go into menopause and that has a different phases in it and if you haven't got a coach who knows sufficiently or consults or refers out, which is fine if that's not your specialism, cool, but there are people who know things, um, you, they, they're not going to be giving you what you are paying for and what you need from like a just a, a training perspective and something that's adding to your life because this is flooring her for days after. Um, and also you, you still got a level of like hormone flux, natural hormone flux below um what we've got for the um, HRT going in. So, you know, you, you're not working with what your body can handle. You're just throwing everything at it and just trying to kind of dig your way back out of this hole that you've plowed back into. Went off on a rant there again, didn't I? So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's get some questions in. So, wow, seven weeks ago this box was. So I put up a question box. Me and Dan answered the first few of these. Um, but then there was some that we didn't cover. So I'm going to pick out ones that I think um, would be interesting to hear your point of view on as well. So Ben's asked, the genie grants you three wishes. You have to use them all for gym and training related benefits. What are you wishing for? He's put better calves as a given. We'll include that as a bonus fourth prize. So three wishes. It's got to be training related, gym or training related. So I'm guessing that could be equipment. It could be having massive biceps. Like, <laughs> like what would your three wishes be? First one would be like just superhero recovery, like across so like the board. Gear like. level recovery without gear. But yeah just beyond that like trend <laughs> on trend yeah that, that is what I want um another one would be to hit goals with linear based progression 
that's a good one. Imagine that going in and literally knowing what your next session was going to be. Like, how, yeah. how good would that feel? You're like, yeah, I feel amazing. Next one, okay, this would be to maintain the physique I want without having to even think about food or anything or nutrition, just like yeah. eat and you look amazing train you look amazing like nothing has an impact on what your physique is they, they seem quite like selfish goals but yeah I, i'd love that yeah, this be a gym or training related benefits so for me it would be um chris bumstead's physique without the gear um so i can keep my health in check yeah. like I, that that man is just I, oh my I, I think most bodybuilders have got a crush on him um yeah just absolutely superhuman um gym related it would be to have a a double garage with soundproofing that is about 20 feet away from any other houses because i'm getting sick and tired of trying to deal with neighbors that want it to be silent all the time you live in a fucking count not council estate you live in a fucking housing estate it's not gonna be silent all the time if i want to lift weights i want to grunt fucking do it um and then third one um yeah i think similarly along the lines of like get to a result and then just be able to maintain it with a minimal effort rather yeah, than that's just a year-round physique and yeah, then so. you can do things to enhance it but it doesn't matter if you don't because it'll still look fucking awesome anyway yeah, exactly. I'll still look like Chris Brumstead. So yeah. <laughs> Chris Brumstead, probably about eight weeks out from the Olympia. So not like Shreddy Kruger, but yeah. Full you, looking, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're going to be getting a, a Gymshark um, modeling contract, basically. <laughs> um, right, what exercise, what, Roger Pegg, what is the exercise you each hate doing the most and why? Don't just say cardio. Uh, Exercises. I 100% know which exercise it is for me. Same. Bulgarian split squats. Yeah, no matter how are. often, <laughs> no matter what way I try to do them, like no matter how much mobility I've got, like they are, they're, oh, they're just hard. My quads are hurting just thinking about them. Um, yeah. I don't even know what it is about them. I just think it's that, that massive hip flex stretch and it's everything and then it's the fact that you, you just fall out of it and it's like you have to compose yourself before switching legs and then you're like oh, i haven't done one fucking set and i've already done two legs like when <laughs> yeah, you yeah. get to the end of that first set your body's <laughs> going ah yeah that's just one leg <laughs> that's why nobody ever programs them for themselves because you're not going to do it like i've done it before and i'm like i'll just move that the next day the next day six weeks later it's still fucking being done but, <laughs> um is it coming home unfortunately it didn't um <laughs> coaching aside what are your goals for the future big one it's gonna get deep isn't it yeah it is what's yours um in terms of competing like whether i win or lose now it's it's irrelevant i'm i'm competing to show that i'm physically and mentally able to get myself into that kind of shape so i but i just i i love the process i i love the bodybuilding lifestyle like the competition is just bleh, like take it or leave it like that that's part and parcel of it of living the lifestyle of a bodybuilder but it's the lifestyle that i enjoy more and i just know for a fact i wouldn't be able to diet down to this level if i wasn't competing and it gives me some i'm one of those people that if i don't have something that i'm working mm -hmm. towards i find it really really hard to make any progress whatsoever just because it's just like what's what's the point like putting yourself through grueling sessions to try and grow that extra like pound of muscle tissue what's the point if you're then not going to then go and kind of compete um so it's one of those it, i'm one of those people that if i saw a level of success with it i'll then probably want to push it onto that next level at the moment it's just right i want to win a, i want to win win my category of a regional i'm going to com be competing in lightweight it's very unlikely that i'm 
I'm going to win an overall, but getting an invite to nationals is kind of my, it's my the next thing phase at the moment. It? When I then get to that next phase, it's then looking at things, it's looking at that. I, I, don't, I don't ever really want to push for a pro card just because I'm 30 now. If I did, I just know it'll take over my life for the next five years. And as well, yeah, done. But then you can put it in your Instagram title, though, can't you? Oh yeah, that I'm what a natty pro. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> natty pro. Bring all, give, give me all the clients. I'm a pro. Yeah. Um, and then, what about what about like a life one or like a business it's, one? Well, it's for me. My business is there to be able to leave a legacy for my daughter is simple things like at the moment ben who's 17 really struggling to get a job i can give him a job he's he's helping me with my social media stuff he's very very good at it but if i didn't own my own business i wouldn't be able to have be able to make that opportunity for him there's things like that like it's one of the reasons why i'm self-employed is i can't stand working for somebody else firstly and secondly like I, I don't want there to ever be a point when he can't get a job because because of COVID and everything it's really really hard it's got zero experience but now when he's applying for jobs he can put me down as a reference that he's had a job there's also I've got a different surname that's what I was going to say yeah, that's <laughs> as well, isn't it? I've, I've had I've let me story this I put my dad down as a reference because I did actually do some work for him like I was properly employed by him He's got the exact same name as me. So the employer thought I was referencing myself. And he was like, like when he said that, I was like, oh, I should really have put Donald Derek Sweeting Senior and then in my name, Junior, and then people will understand it. Yeah. And I was like, why did you give me an interview if I thought? <laughs> Probably just wanted to see how like daft you were. I thought I was, he, he was, I thought it was funny. It was just like, well, I got the job. So clearly I was charismatic in the interview as well. Um. What about yourself? Because obviously you, you've had this big move now. Like, what what are your goals for the future? Yeah, so one of the other reasons I've moved, like, basically I've moved down here for this part-time NHS role, which is um, something that Cheshire Trust have created. It didn't exist before where they've got physio and the bowel and bladder service working together. So basically what I'll be doing is a, a version for the NHS of what I do in my um, online business, okay. which this comes through all referrals. Um, but the other part of that is um, return to uni. So for those of you who don't know, my background's in teaching. I've got like master's degree in um, like sp special needs, specific learning dif difficulties, um, and a lot of like low retaining children used to be an assistant head teacher. But my last master's qualification was like 10 years ago because I'm that old. Um, so I wanted, there was a course I applied for last year, not this year, and that was... Um, can't remember. I think it was at Liverpool, and I got through the interview and everything. And then what they did after is actually look through what they hadn't before all my documents, and they were like, "Yeah, you you couldn't join us straight away. You'd have to do an access course, which is equivalent to doing A levels again, um, because you haven't studied in the last five years." And I'm like, "Yeah, I haven't. But I'm fucking lost my brain cells." So basically, the saying what you did doesn't count. So I was like, "Oh, fuck is had enough here." So. Uh, I then change kind of the route I'm going to go down and I've, I still have to do the goddamn access course this year which is going to be about 20 hours a week of studying so right. no room for anything but um, I'm going to uni next year to study physio for four years so nice. I'm going to be a very mature student um, and that'll sort of in four and a half five years time I will have an MA in physio because my overall kind of goal with what we're talking about here is to integrate practice in terms of what I'm doing now so but at a level which is accessible for more men and more women more children so service of sort of knowing how to improve pelvic health knowing how to improve movement knowing how to improve exercise and just in an overall health umbrella is accessible to more people but not just in a private practice. I am like I'm looking to open it as a community interest project or community interest center where you actually use like charitable funding um, to like deliver resources to people who necessarily can't afford it or it's not local to them as well. Because I love teaching. I am. I love seeing the impact of what I can do on other people to help them improve whatever their goals are. 
Um, I love supporting them to learn more about themselves. Like, this sounds cheesy as fuck, but I don't care. Like, that's, as much as I hate it, like, that's what I love and that's what I'm good at. Yeah. Okay. Um, it always comes at a detriment for me because it's never about money. Like, that's what my biggest downfall is that I do things without consideration for the money, um, which hasn't always worked out in the best ways you can imagine for me in the past. Um, well, that's why that's, you've got me and Dan to balance you out. Exactly, <laughs> you money-grabbing bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah so that's kind of where things are heading like for me that's like my overall goal with everything but I love learning love to be challenged and you know how you talked about training and not having anything to compete for like I'm kind of like that in all aspects of my life where I have goals and I have to always be working towards things because I get very bored like yeah I, I can't I'm really bad like if I went to cinema and watched a film I'd be asleep in about 10 minutes because I'm not like when I switch off that's it bedtime but the rest of the time I'm always like doing reading involved in stuff um and as bad as it sounds like from like a dating perspective because you know I share my hilarious stories with you guys um that's something that I've kind of had as a criticism before like I can't just sit and watch tv like oh that's not normal like what's wrong with you and I'm like I don't want to watch it like this like I, I just I don't find stuff like tv programs like entertaining like I, i'm not getting anything out of it i'm like inv inv investing my time in something that i'm getting nothing out of it's one of those where i i'm similar but it, it's finding that compromise isn't it and it's one of those you give me like... some dating tips there man pardon <laughs> you giving me some dating tips there no, I'm just trying to say about kind of like my own relationship. Like I, I don't sit and watch telly unless I'm sat with Natalie and we'll watch something together. I'd say like 70% of the time I want to watch what's the what's on. The moment we're watching The Handmaid's Tale, which it's one of those things I'll, I'll sit through it. It's okay because she sits through things that she doesn't particularly enjoy but we'll watch it because I like it. Uh, I don't know if you've watched uh, Van Helsing on Netflix. Uh, basically, post-apocalyptic, uh, the vampires have taken over the planet. Um, very, very... It's basically The Walking Dead, but with vampires. It's fucking great. Um, but it's things like that. Like I've had to learn to then switch off doing that because that's something that she enjoys. It's something we can kind of do together. But you're probably not going to make that level of compromise when you're only just getting to know somebody. So if they're put off by the fact that you don't just want to sit there and watch telly, then that person is probably not a good fit for you. Like I'm quite lucky as in my partner supports my goals. So yeah. she loves the fact that I'm driven. She loves the fact that I want to go out there. I want to, I want to run my own business. I want to be my own boss because that's, what I was doing when she met me, that's part of who I am. It's not necessarily something that she wants to do. She's happy and secure working in the NHS, knowing that she's got a regular paycheck coming through. It's a very, very structured, as long as she doesn't majorly fuck up, she's very unlikely to lose a job. Like, okay. like the, the public services, one of the few jobs that were very, very safe during COVID, they were still all having to work. She was still getting full pay. She was still going to work. Like, that's what makes her happy. But she doesn't then input that onto me that I have to go and get a nice stable job as working okay. in an office somewhere because she knows I've been miserable at it and that it will ruin me as a person. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's it's about finding somebody not necessarily that has to have the same level of drive and want to do those things, but at least be willing to accept that that's part of you and part of dating you would be right. We need to go out and do things. We don't just yeah, want to yeah. Netflix and chill. <laughs> but I did an advice with Donald, thanks. No, but that, that actually goes back to in a similar vein, what we talked about at the start, where people have got goals that are linked with physique or um, whatever they're doing from a transformation perspective, it's having people around you who don't necessarily, like, they might not even understand, but they yeah. don't impart their perspective or their judgment on you. 
because they respect that you are making that decision for yourself for specific reasons. 100%. 100%. And I think, um, I don't know about you, I think it is worse with women than it is with men. Um, unsupportive spouses. So whenever I've coached, I've had at least like three girls that I've coached over the years that in the time that they've been training with me, like they've ended up breaking up with their boyfriend at the time because maybe it's your fault because maybe you're the common my fault. denominator here. <laughs> yeah, I am the common denominator here. Um, but it would be like they'd come in and like their boyfriend be moaning at them because of the amount of time they're spending at the gym. If they're starting to get more attention from other men and things basically and then as well it'd be things like right they'd say okay i'm going to cook this meal so, no let's get a takeaway and they'd go no i don't want the takeaway i want to eat my meal and they make a big argument about it and nine times out of ten of what what i try to explain to them is is that you're growing as a person you're leveling up you're becoming a better version of yourself and they either need to one support you as in get on and get involved with this as well. They either, or they need to accept the fact that you are changing, you are becoming yeah. this other person and they then need to. I think that you. last point though, that triggers things in people because it makes them more aware of um, sort of themselves as a more stagnant person. Yeah. And they don't like the fact that you changing as reminding them that they're not. And yeah. if they're unhappy with themselves, that's normally when it comes up because stag stagnation from a perspective of not being aware, but being quite comfortable. They like, yeah. don't really like the word comfortable, but that's what prevents people from growth and change. But not everybody needs or wants to grow and change. And that's cool. Yeah. But again, it's that level of respect in that you, you can't impart that on someone else. If you're happy with your life, you and there are things that you don't want to change, cool. If there are things in your life that you do want to change, get on and change them. Like no mourning or imparting what you think of that other person onto them is going to improve your situation. I've always said, if you're not happy with something, either shut up or do something about it because there isn't an in-between. All you're going to do is annoy yourself or annoy someone else. Like when I was like really, really overweight, I got really sick of my own shit and I'm like, wow you are full of shit do something about this like but it's having to call yourself out and a lot of people don't have that realization and a lot of that does come from comfort in life or being given or handed things because you don't have an appreciation of the hard work and focus it takes to achieve yeah this uh i sound like a right condescending asshole. <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it's something me and dan have talked about before and it's participation trophy syndrome it's someone in the 80s decided right if you just tell people that everything's fine everything's good i'm i'm re-listening to um the subtle art of not giving a fuck great book and yeah. who's listening that hasn't listened to it and basically yeah somebody who's basically done a massive social experiment on us as humans and decided in the 80s i think it was that you tell people that everything's good everything's great life's everyone's a winner everyone can succeed just show up just do your best and you'll you'll be a multi-millionaire one day that if you tell people that's going to happen then they're going to feel better about themselves and we'll have like 10 albert einsteins in every single generation turns out that's not true because life sucks <laughs> life is hard life is about solving problems Life is about overcoming obstacles and becoming a stronger person because of it. Sorry, my dog. Yeah. <laughs> really my attention. Are you okay? Yeah, she's got big. Like, again, six weeks has passed. Um, get down. So by always wanting things to be comfortable, wanting things to feel good, we set ourselves up massively for unrealistic expectations and that okay. people don't want to work. They just want to show up and have it given to them. Yeah. I'll always go back to um, like talking about kind of choosing your hard. Like yeah, things are going to be difficult. Like there's always going to be something about everything you do that you don't like, but it's choosing what you're willing to accept as being like your level of suck or your level of shit. Like you'll tolerate so much because the rest of it is fucking amazing. 
Yeah. Or you'll have things where it's the other way. And that's when you go, right, unhappiness creeps in and resentment creeps in and like non-positive thoughts and feelings creep in, which then has a negative impact on everything else. So, you know, like when it'll sometimes take that one little thing and everything just feels like it's gone to shit. It's because everything's built up. And before you realise, because that level of shit is kind of built and everything's at that level because you haven't made the changes either in yourself or in the things that you, you're sort of working with or addressing to do something it's just going to that like bubbling point one thing and then everything goes out the window so it's kind of spinning your plates your plates have got shit on this is my analogy for this really which it makes zero sense at all no that's a really really good one um and yeah i 100 percent agree with choose your hard like being overweight is hard uh, tracking all your food is hard like yeah. you, you can pick which one that you're going to do. Okay, so the next two questions are about training splits. So Chris Price has put best three days training split for either muscle size or for strength. And then Darren Smith has put best push, pull, legs exercises you can do over a six day split. And you only have 50 minutes for each routine per day. That was a very, very specific question which <laughs> says to me, you want us to write your program. So if that's the case, drop us a DM, pay me and I'll write you a program. <laughs> really messy. Um, I don't know about you, but three day splits for me, full body split. You've only got three days to train, do three full body workouts. Um, if you're wanting to go for strength, make one more push based, one more pull based mm -hmm. and one more squat based. Yeah. Um, so it might be but if you're doing a full body, oh, sorry, carry on. I, I kind of look at sort of the, the push and the pull is from like an exhalation and inhalation perspective or like an anterior and posterior. It doesn't always have to be looked at as push and a pull. Yeah. Um, if you don't know what I'm on about, then it's kind of the front of the body, the back of the body. But also don't just think because you've got like a deadlift in there, your deadlift accessories have to mimic some form of deadlift. They could actually be like inhalation, exhalation based things, which are like a spinal offload because you've just put so much force through your posterior spine. So you're, it, it's been clever with what you're doing. And that is where good coaching comes in, personalized coaching. Like we've always said on the group coaching, this is not the right program for anyone in there, but it's got a good selection of exercises in there that the majority of people in that group can use and benefit from. And we've given kind of options or things you can slightly alter in terms of equipment or setup. But again, for you to know what you need it's having that um, assessment first. It's having your previous injuries taken into consideration, but also always coming back down to like your recovery perspective. Because I know, like Chris had said, best three day split. If, for example, like him, you're working shifts and your three days fall back to back, there's not a chance in hell that you're going to be able to be like full body, full body, full body. Like it's not going to work like that. You might need to be like upper, lower full body switch it around to think about what you want to achieve and what is going to be practical and recoverable so the standard answer it depends yeah which everyone okay. does so for darren best push pull legs exercises so give me two for each one so two push two pull two legs he hasn't stipulated that they have to be in a home gym so just your faith what's your favorite two push exercises Favourite two pull exercises and favourite two leg exercises. Okay. Push for put one push, I'd have like a barbell and I, then I'd have dumbbell. And I'd be thinking of kind of what my preference would be in terms of whether I want to do one shoulder focus, one chest focus. Um, and thinking about sort of any injuries. So if I've sort of sh struggled with shoulder stabilization, I might be wanting to work the triceps a little bit more. So my push might be um, more narrow based, um, sorry, like neutral based dumbbell push. Sorry. Dumbbell <laughs> press even for chest. And then I might be going sort of incline shoulder, um, even in a Smith machine as well, depending on how advanced you are in your training, where it falls in the session as well. So that'd be my push. Sorry, the, uh, my meal preps are up on the, the countertop and the cat is after me. <laughs> Literally, you'd, when you're this deep in prep, do not mess with my food. Cat, right, he's getting chipped out. 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 
Literally out the window, not even like out the room. Not Get out the fucking out the house. Window. Get out the house. <laughs> trying to eat my food. Did you see that picture on my story where I left her? I was good. Bought Natalie a pizza home. Like left oh, it. Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah. Cooker, but the fucker got through the plastic. Like I've left one out before where I'd undone it, and I was like, okay, you know what? That's my bad. I've left cheese out on the side. The cat's in. No, he fucking clawed off the plastic and <laughs> ate the cheese and he only ate half of it as well so then i had to go out and buy another pizza but anyways um you should just bought him one to start with technically it's your fault but yeah, bad cat dad. yeah i should i should have bought the cat a pizza yeah 100 <laughs> um push exercises so for me i i mean a bodybuilder i definitely prefer dumbbells over barbell work um just because i find that the range of motion and also the Ability to actually contract the pecs is so much better because you can move around the elbows and find what biomechanically works for you. Yeah, you're not if fixed really, then, are you? A lot of guys actually with a straight barb, like I actually find I do get quite a good contraction from a barbell bench press. A lot of my clients that I've always worked with have really, really don't. They just can't, they can't engage their pecs properly. It's mostly shoulders. Um and then, so yeah, dumbbell, um, dumbbell chest press uh, on a bench, normally one click up, because again, just flat dumbbell bench, the risk to reward ratio in terms of like going too far through the range of motion to through further than your active range of motion is a lot more. And just one click up on the incline just takes away that tendency for people to kind of go too far through it without making it into an incline exercise where you're using more pec uh, minor instead of major um and then the other push would be something on a fixed plane so either a chest press machine or i use a smith machine just because i'm training at home just because again when you are wanting to really really overload the pecs just when it's in a fixed plane you can just keep that tension you can focus on maximally engaging the pectoral muscle rather than kind of controlling a dumbbell or a barbell um when i was a young coach like everything was free weights like there's no there's no place for a smith machine there's no place for like machines like pussies use machines real <laughs> men use free weights and now actually i learned i'm using more machines than uh free weights um in terms of pull i love now single arm what cable work so even like lap pull downs etc like the contraction that i can get doing one side at a time is so much better just because again my elbow if you're on a, a straight bar nine times out of 10 biomechanically it's not going to get you into the right yeah, place yeah. whereas just one cable down and having that bar move straight down you can move your elbow around to feel where you then get actually that that final contraction that last little bit and then rack pulls i just love rack pulls i can't do them at the moment because my neighbors are such twats <laughs> and they can't have any vibration go through the floor it's one of the reasons why i've had to join a gym is to be able to do leg day like just because Apparently, I was too noisy on the leg press. Bought a thousand pound leg press and I can't even use it. You should um, just bill them, be like, well, you can pay for this because I can't use it. <laughs> yeah. Or we just move house. We're literally, yeah. we're going to move house. <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> what about pull then? Your two favorite pull exercises? Uh, always going to go for a deadlift variation. Always. Um, and cables, again, love a cable, but. Um, so instead of kind of fixed machines, grabbing like D handles, which are the, it's basically like, you know, like your soft handles, you can use the metal ones, whatever you'd attach to a cable machine, always called like a D because it's a D shape, yeah. attaching that to a long bar and then doing that from either seating, sitting on a bench on the floor behind the seat. So say we've got a normal lap pull down on a bench uh, on there or on the floor and kind of stabilizing so you're getting a lot of core stability work out of it as well and then using the alignment that you can create by just sliding the d handles over the long bar itself mm -hmm. that allows you to kind of supinate and pronate to suit what your shoulders actually need and clients you, really connect with that you, really, really well 
have you seen the assister lifts? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I've I'm got kind one of, of those. Yeah, so I've kind of just done this one because obviously if you've got clients in commercial gym, unless they want to spend money on the kit, it's like an easy way of doing this. All I'd yeah. say is just make sure that your D handles are either double looped or you can kind of use straps to yeah. sort of keep them where they are. Otherwise, you'll add a client's individual once and she was like, off and I was like how did that feel she was like I could feel it more on my left I'm like just watch a fucking video button then um, <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah what? I really like that just in terms of the connection you can get with what your body needs and from a setup position as well because you're you're using a brace to stabilize yourself so you know when you're traditionally see guys like chucking yeah. themselves up and down you can't do this because the weight will pull you so yeah. you have to stabilize and get into that the starting position for you as well and if you think about I'll always go like strongman when we're um log pressing you think about using that kind of upper shelf which is what your lats sort of create and where you get the engagement then like I, I love it from like the pump perspective as well just it feels good yeah definitely and then final two leg exercises there's so many to oh, choose from <laughs> no okay I'm gonna go squat because technically like squat is squat and deadlift their full body because you're literally using your whole full body but always go with squat variation again suit whatever you need i love a safety bar squat like i love a safety bar squat and um, safety bar is one thing that is on my shopping list if i ever see a half decent one come up in marketplaces that and a trap bar i got the which one did i get last year um the open trap bar hmm Really good, really good bit of kit. I like it for single leg work as well, like beast dance deadlifts, because it's yeah, open yeah. so you can sort of move around. Actually good for bent over work as well, or working traps. Like it's yeah. a, such a good bit of kit. Um, and other lower, I am going to say, what am I going to say? I don't know. What's not the favorite lower? I really like a uh, seated ham curl. Okay just the development you can get out of yeah. a seated ham curl like you you can't cheat that like you know like on a lane one depending on sort of there's so many factors yeah, to you, consider for yeah, where yeah, hip placement hips, is and yeah. just kind of chuck it up but with this you cannot cheat it and like yeah i love a good seated one what's yours so legs it depends if it's for me or if it's for clients so for me um I love a leg press now. Like I've only started using them in the last two years. So basically since I started training like a bodybuilder, I would avoid the leg press like the plague before I started training like a bodybuilder. And then I got one put in my program. I was like, oh, what is this bullshit? I could just go and squat. And then I actually learned how to use a leg press properly. And it's one of those things where just because it's so much more stable, you can just over like, I put up some of my photos from like two years ago to like now where they're both like eight weeks out and you you can see that I've added a decent amount of thickness to my legs and the majority of that has come from the leg press because yeah. you can load it up so much better <laughs> and your muscles actually fail rather than your technique failing so that's yeah. the big difference between a squat and a leg press is that you're very very unlikely unless you're like a high level power lifter be able to take yourself to actual muscle failure during the squat yeah. because your you're just your technique will give out a long time before your muscles will whereas you, when you're you require like it's a it's a full body so at one point at some point even if you've got strongest legs in the world your upper back's not going to be able to take the amount of weight you've got on it and there's so many obviously risk factors concerned in there but then yeah. leg press as well i really like leg press in terms of people you learning how to actually use the ranges they have access to because yeah. it's a kind of a coaching from, okay, well, your hips are lifting there. Where's your bum? Do we need a pad behind your back? Like finding your optimal position to see that growth. Because you'll have seen guys yourself, girls as well, been leg pressing for years. And yeah, the numbers are going up. But why aren't your legs growing? And you're like... Because you look at the okay. lower back and it's, <laughs> it's exactly. destroyed. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one is a lunge variation. So I think lunges are massively underutilized in the gym because most people find them really uncomfortable. Most people find them really uncomfortable because your hip flexors are tight. Your hip flexors are tight because you spend all day on your ass. So when 
people actually, you ask them to lunge and they send you a video and are like, Jesus Christ, did that hurt your knees? Yeah, of course it did. You, your step wasn't big enough. Oh, it hurts my, um, it feels uncomfortable on the back leg when I do a bigger step. Yeah, that's your hip flexor. That's why we're doing it <laughs> because your hip flexor is super tight. But oh, even like pel pelvic orientation from sitting in certain positions, like I'm leaning forward. So straight away think about the position and my hamstrings as well, because they're forced into the positions you put them into every day. So it's like, okay, you need to make sure you're primed for what you're going to be doing. And even with like your lunge variations, you can get so much out of it because you change your torso angle and it yeah. changes the exercise completely as well. 100%. So yeah. Um, in terms of exercise, you can do over a six day split and you only have 50 minutes for each routine. Darren, get a coach if you want them to write you a full program, um, just because you, we, we can't cover that in a, a five minute Q&A. There's too many factors in there. Um, training history, uh, goal, <laughs> which would be number one. Like, are you training for hypertrophy? Are you training for strength? Like your program is going to look completely different. Um, if you're saying a push pull legs per program, to me that says um, hypertrophy. Um, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of programs out there on the internet free, um, where you can just type in 50 minute push pull legs program, and yeah. they'll be able to bring you just up a even, template. Yeah, just even start with one, then decide if you're happy with just doing that. Does it work for you? So at least if you go to a coach. You can say to them, I've tried this, and they say, right, like, show me what you've been doing, because it's really hard to work from a blank canvas when people come to you, and, and like, it's fair enough taking a beginner as long as you can start to coach them in the process, but getting someone who's just been going into the gym, doing things ad hoc, and then once this six-day program thrown on them, like, mate, you, you're going to die, like, <laughs> you're not going to make any progress, and you're going to hate what you do, and you're going to find so many exercises uncomfortable, or that you, you're struggling to see progress with. And what you'll do is you'll get pissed off because your coach will send you like one day of program that'll probably have four exercises on because if you're doing a six day week split, you can't handle the amount of volume that would be thrown at you if you took something that you'd potentially have on a three day week split. Like it, it's very different. And even if you can, it's an irresponsible coach that will throw you in at that point because the average person can't. So like I've had guys that I've coached before and they've gone from doing a, um, a three-day split up to a four-day split up to a five-day split. And once you kind of get to a five-day split, the only way you can really go from there is to add more volume into each session. But we are, every single week, there is a question in there. How are you feeling? What's your stress levels like? Are you coping, are you, have you got any injuries this week? We are constantly assessing whether we've tipped you over that maximum mm -hmm. recoverable volume. And that's the difference between having a coach and just buying a program online. You get that consistent um, feedback where we can go, right, let's push you a little bit more. Let's push you up. Oh, we've overreached here. Shit, right? Let's pull things back to where you are actually making really, really good results. And I think... Um, somebody put something up on the group the other day about like online coaching and a lot of people were like, oh, we don't value it. And um, like, I'm not going to pay more for coaching than I would for a gym membership and things like that. And it's just to me that says you don't really. Training is a skill. Just like if you decided at 18 years old, I'm going to learn to drive. You wouldn't just hop into your car, pop down to the local test center and expect on day one to be able to pass your test. You can read a few books about it as well. And you still probably wouldn't be ready to pass your test because there are a lot of intricacies that kind of go on. And if you just try and figure those out on your own, you're going to pick up some really fucking bad habits. Or it'll take you fucking years instead of investing and then be in a position where a lot of guys and girls are where they feel confident enough and competent enough to go it alone and then can kind of identify where they're going right and wrong because they've invested in learning it's the same as education like unless somebody teaches you something you're not going to learn it best by reading a book on it because you won't learn those certain nuances or things that you need to question yourself because that's at a different level of experience and detail 100 percent. so yeah i just wanted to address that just because 
it, that post was hilarious. <laughs> but it, oh yeah, some of the the responses on there were absolutely great. Um, it seemed to be a mixture of the gym bro who has got a certain level of results. And this is this is there's an old saying that a little bit of knowledge is very dangerous because what happens is when you get a little bit of knowledge, you think you know everything. When actually the longer you spend it, the more you realize is there's always more to learn because things are always changing. And there also is no one right answer. It depends. There's a reason why we say it depends a lot on this show, because actually with 25 years experience, we all kind of realize it nine times out of 10, you can't just give a straight answer. You we need more information. Um, yeah oh last one actually here's a question one of your clients loses all motivation through no fault of their own let's say a breakdown or mental health issues how do you get them back to achieving their goals knowing they lack positivity so for me that would 100 percent be a referral out they've had a mental health breakdown i am in no way qualified to be able to help someone get through that because it's it's out of my scope of expertise. I, I could be there as a support, but I would always refer that out to a professional. If you're having a mental health crisis, there are free services. I think it's Steps to Change is a free service. Yeah. I personally went through a bit of a mental health crisis and at the moment they're so underfunded that unless you're on the verge of like topping yourself, they're probably not gonna do a lot. However, there are lots and lots of counseling services, talking services. Those are normally where 90, I'd say 95% of people get the most benefit from it rather than going down a pharmaceutical route. Obviously, always speak to your doctor, sometimes getting some uh, chemical assistance to balance things out to get you away from the edge can help. But nine times out of 10, going to some talking therapies, talking through your problems, it's the prices range massively it's anywhere from like 25 to 40 pounds for a session most of them do zoom calls now because of covid like they've had to adapt so even if you can't find one like locally to you um a lot of them have moved to kind of like going online like i'm going to open up here myself like i have been to an online counselor i dealt with a lot of uh, imposter syndrome issues a lot of issues with my dad and my mum having Alzheimer's disease um, dealing with a lot of guilt and the fact that like I was getting a certain level of success like I've had to deal with a lot of those issues personally and I wouldn't want anyone to ever kind of go through that themselves and it's not within our scope to be able to help coach you through coping mechanisms and that that is a profession on its own. There's a reason why those guys have to study for two to three years to be able to help people because no two people are the same. My coping mechanisms and Rachel's coping mechanisms are probably going to be very different because we are completely different people. We've got different backgrounds. We've got we're going to have different issues. So going to somebody who knows how to deal with that and can talk you through the issues that you're having and then they can then make a plan for you to help you cope with those um i think you deal with a lot more of the mental health side of stuff don't you rach so what what would your say on that be so i'm plug my phone and um, so i've got like qualifications in counseling like children adolescents from previous career um, but last year I did, I qualified as a mental health first aider. Um, that was during the first lockdown and that was a lot to help me help myself, but also so that when the gyms were allowed to reopen for like fucking never, um, I was in a position to spot any signs of anyone coming through my door who had been isolating on their own for however long. Um, and again, it wasn't for me to be able to diagnose anything like that. It was for me to be able to spot signs where um, something might be sort of out of character. It might be the way someone said something, um, like how to sort of understand mood a little bit better. But off the back of that as well. So I did this. It was at such a good course. Um, I've never, I think I just shared it on my 
Jim, just to make people aware that I've done this and that if they, like, as well take a safe space for them, like, I'm knowledgeable about how to keep you safe, really. Um, but obviously would be referred out and wouldn't deal with anything myself. Because again, I'm not qualified. I've got experience in things like this, but I'm not qualified. Um, but I also seen, um, I think it's a Scottish guy, and this got my back up phenomenally. So he's advertising. Uh, I'm not even apologising if he listens or anyone who's done it if they listen, because I don't agree with it, and I'll tell you why. So he's um, it, he's got this course, and it's mental health qualification for personal trainers right it's a grand or so um and i think some of it's in person or some on zoom whatever i don't think that anyone who is a personal trainer unless you have got experience and qualifications directly in counseling and you stay on top of your cpd and ongoing professional development as in you also work in this profession alongside like um, your personal training as well I don't think that any of us should be saying that we are in a position to help someone just because we're there to help with their health I think health physical health and mental health do go very much hand in hand but this is kind of purporting that you would then be there in a counseling capacity and I think that portrait is a very dangerous message to you potentially getting a new client who thinks right, I'm dealing with a lot of anxiety, I've had a bereavement, I'm, I'm not feeling where I am, but if I go to this person for some physical transformation, I'll also get my mental health sorted out. I think that is detrimental to the relationship to begin with, and also to kind of what this person thinks that they're going to get out of their problems being solved by this one person who is on paper a personal trainer, not a qualified, experienced counsellor, Another rant then, but I think a really pertinent one for anybody who might have heard of people taking this qualification and going to them thinking, oh, well, they, I'm getting a two for one, really. My physical health, my mental health, because if you need support with counselling and your mental health is a priority and a, a separate entity, you need that as a separate entity, not as yeah. a bundle deal. Yeah, because I've, I've seen that course. I've got friends that have been on it. And I thought it was interesting because obviously physical health and mental health are so closely tied. And I think personal trainers can be a positive influence on people's mental health. But I do agree that actually is because I've got this mental health qualification now, it, it could be seen, as you said, by the general public that, um, I am getting two for one here when actually it'd be interesting to see in that program if they're then say for example they're giving you those the um the mental health first aid sort of thing of being able to spot those issues to then refer them out to somebody who is better yeah. qualified to be able to do them I haven't done the course so I wouldn't kind of be able to know yeah if that is kind of like what they're doing or they're just trying to get people to focus on positive uh, self-image and um, and the empowering effect exercise can have because of things like when you start in the gym like you try and get to somebody to do a squat and they can't do it so then you make it easier and you get them onto a box squat and then they do that for a few weeks and then you take the box away and they do a goblet squat and they can do that. And then you go back to doing your squat assessment and suddenly they can get all the way down and all the way back up. You've taken them from something that they couldn't do before you've put something in place and now they can do it. They've had an obstacle and they've overcome it. And that, that's a very, very powerful thing because for a lot of people in their life, like you were saying before, they get comfortable. They don't push themselves they get to an obstacle and they stop because uh, it's a lot of effort to yeah. figure out how to do that when I'm already getting paid to do everything on this side of it. So why would I want to push myself and get over that? Because when I get over that, there's going to be another one and that's going to be even harder. So actually I can stay this side, be comfortable, collect my paycheck, just, and I think it's, it's always interesting when you can, take people that when you then speak to them they've never been pushed 
They've never been encouraged to actually see what they're capable of. So they're always doing things well within their capability, whereas actually you get them to start pushing past their comfort zone and they realize they're so much more capable than they thought. And they then start to see that have then a knock on effect to kind of like other areas in their life. Yeah. Like I think that aspect is something that not enough personal trainers slash online coaches like tap into. Mm-hmm. But I can 100% agree with what you're saying there about how you've got to then be very, very careful how you market improving somebody's mental health. Like, uh, I'm not going to say his name. He doesn't listen to this, but <clears throat> I know he watches a lot of my social media. So when you see this, you'll know, you know, because he's so arrogant, he won't think I'm talking about him. And <laughs> like, he claims that like he can like solve problems that are way out of the scope of his ability because he's a poor trainer at best like the before and after photos that he put up are from the gym like I worked in two years ago so he's clearly not got any results since then like the results that he puts up you're just like which one's the before and which one's the after is that that level of result but anyways um he's blocked me on Instagram, but I often get like screenshots from like old clients where they ping this across being like, what's this joker doing? I was like, please stop sending these because they just irritate me now. And like one of them was like, oh, uh, sell women, cellulite. Like you don't have to accept this. I know this secret thing that like blah, blah, blah and all this. And I was like, one, you're set, setting up the average person to look at cellulite as something to like be ashamed of. Like it's completely normal for women to have cellulite. Like I went to um, body power and we had fitness models walking around in those skimpy shorts and they still had cellulite. Like it's normal, like even at any sort of level of body fat. And then another one was basically claiming like, basically I can fix your mental health. Like, like and I just don't I don't know where in his head he gets that it's acceptable to say that because what will happen is somebody that's really really struggling will come he will do his condescending bullshit coaching that he does and he'll send them down into a downward spiral because they were already teetering on the edge and he'll say something stupid along the lines of like you just don't want it enough that person might be bipolar they might have a serious issue and right, they've not been able to keep to the 1300 calories that you've set them because that's not that's not an acceptable amount of food for somebody to eat. Or you just don't want it enough. Try harder. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think with what you've just said, the two things that like I sincerely hope it's neither of them, because I'd hate to think that a course came at such an expense where a trainer was paying to do the things that really they should that should be ingrained in what everybody practices what they preaches levels of progression levels of regression levels of reflection and coaching the person mm. and then obviously with the other side purporting that they can solve mental health is not a thing to be solved no. and it is it's again it's a language in the marketing and I, I just going back to your question there it's within our scope to coach positive language to coach positive behavior to support that person in their journey, but it's within our duty of care to also do that and know when to have a conversation where for their health, we are having to and wanting to support them in a referral out and we will be part of that and we will play a role in that because I've got dialogue with um, physiotherapists who do internal assessments with my clients or do injury assessments and then they feed back to me because we have that holistic relationship focused around that client where we're all working for the best for that person and the more people can see that as a health professional you have a role to play in this a referral doesn't mean a I can't help you off you go it means I want to support you but we need support to allow this to help you 100% I think more trainers should operate within that holistic side of things like I'm always amazed like I'll have clients that right they picked up an injury they're going to see their physio I'll say to them look speak to your physio like give them my email address I can gather theirs I will speak to them Like, I want to know the exercises they want you to do. So I'll put them in your warm-ups and your cool-downs. Have I heard from a physio? Like, I think I've heard from one. That's maybe 15 in the the nine years I've been a PT. Mm -hmm. 
that's probably happened 15 times I've heard from one like I don't under like I don't know whether they just don't respect kind of like what we do or whatever it is but I know for a fact from my own experience when I'm injured if I put my prehab slash rehab work into my warm-ups and cool downs they will get done four yeah. times five times a week if I don't it will be lucky if they get done once a week because it's just one more thing to remember. Yeah. It's like everything. integrated services. Um, like I'll always say everything I do with pe- with anyone from a recovery or rehab perspective, it needs to be built into something which is manageable and actually going to get done. But also it, that comes down to the professions respecting each other as well. Like we've got enough about ourselves to know that people need to be referred out. And it's not it's not me say, sending someone to another coach who is a specialist in this and then I lose the client. It's then that referral out or to, to get to a different level or it is a consultation which is going to allow you to do your job better. And I think more, more professions or more individuals need to look at that because... It's your client who's at the heart of this and you should be doing whatever you need to do to not not keep them with you, but to show them that you're capable of sort of managing what you can and you're supporting things like holistically that you don't have the specialty or specialism. Like when we're talking about menopause, just because you're a male doesn't mean you can't coach a female who is going through menopause and struggling with certain things it means that then you would say right do I know anyone within my network who can support me or who my client might want to speak to privately but ultimately they're staying with me and they're going to want to because you've shown that level of interest and investment in doing the best for them yeah I think I think that is the difference I think a lot of coaches are so especially when they're young they're so protective yeah. over that that client because they're they're coming it's from been a seen place. To like not know isn't it it's like and, and well it's also coming from a place of lack they don't want to lose that client because they don't have the body of say results or they're not working with that many clients they they want to they want to know everything like i've always prided myself on right if i don't know the answer to a question i will tell you that i don't know And I will say to you, but by the next time that we speak, I will have an answer for you or I'll be able to refer you to somebody who does. Because I'm not afraid to say that I don't know something. Like I know quite a lot because I love this subject and I absorb, I must listen to at least an hour or two of content when it comes to training or that kind of stuff, at least an hour or two of content a day, just because I do it when I'm walking the dog. there's very few things that I don't at least know something about, but I'm secure enough in myself to know when I don't know something and then go, you know what? No, I'm not an expert in this area. However, I know this person who knows a lot more about it than I do. Or, And I think actually it makes you look better as a coach because it shows that you're willing to network with other people. You're willing to know your own limitations and to be able to like okay I don't know that but I know somebody who does here go and speak to this person because then you get known as the person who knows people and being that person that knows a lot of people that know a lot of things like as you said you can affect so many more people doing that just like yourself doing the education stuff you're coaching those coaches that might coach an average of say 50 clients each year. Yeah. So if you've coached 10 of them, you've then impacted on 500 people in a year rather than the 50 clients that you can coach kind of personally. Yeah. You do 10 of those seminars over the course of 12 months, you've helped 5,000 people. It's, it's exponential. Yeah, it's the same as like having that coaching network. Like, it's cool to have a specialism, but you know, when you see like Instagram bios that have got like fat loss specialist, strength specialist, powerlifting specialist, and you're like, mate, you're not, you're not fucking, you don't know everything. Like, and then it's like, who are you trying to attract other than anyone? Like be good at what you're good at and have a strong enough network of people to refer out to, to consult with, because that makes you look better at what you do because you're not doing everything really badly. <laughs> The, you know um, what I mean like you could probably yeah. list off yeah well it 
The one that really got me recently is somebody who is very much a strength coach. What they do, what they're good at, but they've tried to shoehorn themselves into the transformations market. Because, well, fortunately or unfortunately, there's a lot more money in that side of it. However, if you're a good strength coach, there's still plenty of money to be made. It's just, you just have to go about it in a different way. Um, but they've, they've kind of gone into that market. They've kind of absolutely blitzed it. They're going in at a very low price point. And then they're wondering why their turnover is so high. And it's just like, well, one, you clearly haven't done your research on this market because actually churn in this side of the market is very high because people want results and they want them in 90 days. That's why they will pay 500, 700, 1,000. Like I know coaches that are selling like 5,000 pound packages for a 90 day package. And they're doing it because what they do is they work with high level CEOs and they know how to solve those guys' problems. And because they can solve them really well over a 90 day period, somebody will pay them five grand. These are the people that are getting like um, ultimate fitness level um, <laughs> results, but they, they're getting it online and in 90 days. And because they can get the results, they can kind of charge that amount of money. But when you kind of just said, right, I'm going to go online, right? I'm going to change like my niche to this just because there's money in it. And then I'm going to try and undercut people. It, it just makes you look like a shitty coach just because you're just like, right, that, that's not, that's not what you're good at. Like, <laughs> that's not what your results are. <laughs> like, and I think people, people pay for a result at the end of the day and if you can show that you can get a result like you can charge more money and that's that's capitalism like that's that's what it is as you get more experience as you get better quality results like there's there's always going to be a vast amount of variety kind of within the market and if you want to spend 25 pounds a month with somebody who's fresh out of being a personal trainer and get very much a cookie cutter program yes you can text them 24 hours a day because there's they're up all night like trying to service clients because they don't know how to manage a business but if you are sat at home with three kids and trying to balance like having a mortgage and all that kind of stuff that 22 year old who's fresh out of university and can stay up till two o'clock in the morning doing that kind of stuff probably isn't going to be able to empathize with the problems that you're going to have and they'll say things like oh you just don't want it enough suck it up and get on with your eating plan yeah. yeah kids don't need to eat you just meal prep for yourself it's fine exactly right you don't yeah or just <laughs> eat, eat something completely different to the rest of your family because that's not alienating at all or oh, the best one that coach that i was telling you before when i was prepping last time i was still working at the previous gym and he was he was my manager at the time i'll give it away to some people who uh watch this <laughs> but I don't you'll just get like loads of messages after this yeah uh, they all know i think he's a I'm not going to say the C-bomb because that definitely will get this money all the time. <laughs> um, even like we make any money off it anyway. Um, True. Basically, so um, I've been called into the, I was having one of my like, one-to-ones, which is the most like waste of time thing ever um, with him. Like I've had managers where they've been worthwhile. Having one of my one-to-ones and he's saying like, you, you're looking a bit tired. I was well, six weeks out at this point like doing at least an hour I think I was doing yeah an hour of cardio a day um on probably about 1800 calories and Willow was not even one so she wasn't sleeping through the night so disturbed sleep high stress high output you're gonna look a little bit drained and I'm basically said about like I'm not sleeping or my food's quite low and it's like have you thought about sleeping in a different bed it's like have you honestly just said that to me? Please, please don't say you say that. Really, I'll, I'll, I'll just get Natalie on the phone here. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I felt like going, you've not had a serious relationship before, have you? You've not, you've probably not shared your bed with somebody for an extended period of time. He was about 22. I think he was in the closet, if I'm honest. Like, not that I've got anything about that. But I don't think he'd ever had like a long-term relationship because he was so confused about himself. Yeah. Not because that there's anything wrong with being gay. Like I'm, I've got gay friends, I'm 
I'm not homophobic. Like that's the ultimate thing. Um, that's what everyone says. Yeah, exactly. They're like it's the what, two standard it's what, you, it's what when you say like you're racist. No, no, no. I've got yeah. a black friend. I'm normally that black friend. <laughs> yeah. So it's I like don't Donald. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I was just yeah. I was in my head. I was going. You, you can't give out like blanket. Yes, that makes logical sense. If the baby doesn't sleep all night, sleep in a separate bed. However, that also means I'm probably not going to have a relationship to go back to when I finish this process, which isn't isn't worth it. So why why would you? Yeah, it's just it's stupid advice from somebody who's never been in that situation. And it is very very important for young coaches to get experience, but you also shouldn't bullshit your way through a situation and try and give life experience to somebody who's like way ahead of you in yeah. life and it's the same as you, you know what I mentioned in the, um the chat this week and I was talking about the drug and diuretic protocols and stuff like that how mm. dangerous that has been it's that sort of thing and it's like even from experienced coaches like you still got to look at things from kind of a detached perspective because you need to then go right is this going to affect my health is this going to affect my relationships is is everything I'm doing in a positive manner going to help me get my goals or what are the dangers involved in this and I don't just mean dangers from like losing your relationship but like as we've seen in the past however many months like obviously deaths linked with them really poor advice and guidance can't even use those terms to be honest but yeah the the information that's coming out sort of through bodybuilding is you know I think it's things that people have already known but again as we know it takes for people to speak up before things start to be addressed because you're looking at reputable competitors who are then saying okay well I've had to come away from the sport because it's had this a long lasting effect on my health like I'm having to have um like liver transplants and all sorts so I know that's on the far end of the scale but again it's like you are always in control of using the information that is given to you and if that information sets any alarm bells off question it it's like we'll always encourage our clients to ask why if you're programmed something and they don't really agree with it or they don't want it in I'll always say well tell me why you don't want it in I'll tell you why I'm putting it in and it's always that education behind things but again from that health first perspective and also like being a human yeah yeah definitely um I think that's probably going to be a good place to leave it because we've been on for nearly two hours Rach this is why you don't get me on because it's like <laughs> get rid of an hour she's done a stint <laughs> No, it's been it's been good. We've had a, a good long chat. It's gonna be take me ages to edit this down. And also, if anybody's laid it all the way to the end of this one, I will be editing. So this is episode fifty-five. Episode fifty-four never got um, edited and put out. So some of those questions me and Dan have covered, and then some of them me and you have covered. So it'll be nice for um having well with there being what a seven week hiatus people are now going to get three hours of uh no probably more like closer to four hours of us guys chatting. we made up for it it's fine exactly like there's lots of content there for you guys to enjoy just under uh indulge yourselves in so uh where can the guys find you um if they want to um speak to you drop you a dm like where can they find you on your socials my social media instagram is rs underscore strength underscore coach i'm one of the admin mods in the home gym uk community group as well and normally post in the sales page with things based in the north which everyone hates me for um i've got a website that is in the process of coming up but that'll kind of just be more information and um, but most of my useful stuff is on instagram except for recently when it's been about DIY. <laughs> Fair enough. And everybody who wants to catch me, I'm at DHPT on both Instagram and Facebook. So it's been great to chat to you, Rach. I will catch up with you again soon. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye.